Voices from the Blog, a collection of unforgettable short stories, poems, and essays from emerging and established writers, all members of the Writer's Blog. These original works are guaranteed to stroke your heart, mind, and soul as they reveal in written form the very essence of life. Prepare to read about the ups and downs of marriage, the emotional trauma of being without child, the questionable mental state of writers, the regrets of murderous decisions, mother-daughter life patterns, and so much more. By selecting and reading this offering, you've made a decision to laugh, learn, cry, to be offended and soothe. In summary, to scale the range of light and dark emotions. So sit back, get comfortable, and enjoy the experience. Book Lovers Unite! I'm Demetheus Jackson, and you're listening to the Chapter One Podcast. The greatest stories ever written all begin with Chapter One. And each episode, our guest authors will share their first chapters with you. Today, I'll be speaking with a wonderful novelist and short story writer, Ann Fields. She's the co-founder of Writer's Block, which is a national organization of African-American writers. The organization publishes a collection of work written by its members. It's called Voices from the Block, a collection of African-American literature. And today, Ann will be reading a selection from Volume 1. And that starts right now. Six, one spring evening, while the sky was still gray, not black, me, my brother, and sister were playing in the backyard of grandmother's house near the kitchen window. This area was actually prohibited from play for two reasons. One, we often ended up in grandmother's small herb garden, trampling on her fragrant, fragile plants, and two, We sometimes lingered under the kitchen window to eavesdrop on grown folks' conversation, which is exactly what happened when I chased a ball into the herb patch. A few enticing words tickled my ears, making me pause and play and stand possum still, unaware that the next few minutes of talk would result in me losing my childhood. But gaining my life's purpose. Miss Flora, my grandmother's best friend, was saying, no help from the police. Wouldn't surprise me if they cheered them on. I heard my grandmother tisk, tisk, followed by, no justice for his parents. Was a good boy, too, if and you don't count the heavy drinking. That six ain't no place for darkies after dark, I tell you. I heard a chair scratch against the floor and knew Miss Flora was pushing back to leave. I prayed hard that when they laid that new road, all the killing would stop. Grandmother sighed. But I guess the white folks are okay with new blood on their new road. A parent Lee. And that being the case, I'ma take my black tail home before it gets much darker. I heard their footsteps and parting words veering toward the back door and flew out of that fertile patch of land. By the time they made it outdoors, play had resumed further away from the house. But neither my mind nor my heart was into kick and catch. Their words bounced around in my head, distracting me. Blood? Six? Killing? The words were scary enough by themselves, but when added to the dark tones I'd heard in grandmother's and Miss Flora's voices, they became downright frightening, but meaningful too. The scary part I understood, but the weight of their words I didn't. I thought about it hard though, trying to figure it out, and came up with nothing. Frustrated, I turned back fully to the game and realized I had missed catching another of my sister's kicks. 
angry now that those words and an unexplainable, uncomfortable feeling had me so bound that I was losing, I kicked a rock way out into the field. That felt good, but I still couldn't believe that I, the oldest, was losing to my younger and smaller siblings. Well, I hadn't lost yet. I was only two points behind. I could easily make that up. Crouching low and holding my arms out wide, a position meant to threaten my siblings and guarantee my success, I glared at the ball. But by the time my brother lined up his kick and launched the red rubber ball into the air, my mind had latched yet again onto the adult's word puzzle. I wondered about a meaning and a feeling that avoided understanding and grew even more upset. I bet, I thought, if I were an adult, I would understand, or maybe if I were a straight-A student. But thinking things didn't make them so. So their words kept clouding my brain, causing me, the big brother, to do something I never did, lose a game of kick and catch to my brother and sister. Shortly after I lost, grandmother called us in for dinner and baths. Neither the delicious meal grandmother had cooked, nor the thorough scrubbing, distracted me from my distraction. Even when we were on our knees, with grandmother leading us in our nightly prayers, I could not keep my mind on Jesus. I kept thinking about killings and Highway 6. I wish I could tell you the troubling subject vanished during sleep, but no. It waited for me upon waking. I dressed for school thinking about it, and as I was walking out the door to catch the school bus, I decided that since I couldn't undo the hearing of the words, couldn't undo the feeling of mystery and fear, couldn't talk to grandmother or any other adult about it for fear my questioning would get back to grandmother who would quickly figure out I'd been eavesdropping, which would mean another butt busting and my behind was still sore from the last one. The best thing I could do was research the topic myself and once settled, return my mind to the more important things like playing ball and winning. I wanna take this moment to share with you a few amazing things that I've discovered. If you're listening to this podcast, then I'm assuming you listen to podcasts in general. And if so, you really want to check out The Art of Charm, AOC with Jordan Harbinger. The Art of Charm brings together some of the best thought leaders, teachers, and exceptional individuals to teach you how to be a top performer in life, love, and at work. Imagine having a mix of experienced mentors teaching you their expertise, packing decades of research, testing, and tough lessons into a curriculum. That's what you get with AOC. I highly recommend this podcast for both men and women. I guarantee it will change your life. Be sure to listen to their show on iTunes or wherever podcasts are streamed. And for all of you aspiring writers out there, specifically in the Dallas-Fort Worth area of Texas, if you're looking to take your writing to the next level, then the DFW Writers Workshop is for you. The DFW Writers Workshop helps and encourages North Texas writers of all genres and experience levels to produce professional quality writing suitable for publication. I've personally been involved with the DFW Writers Workshop for over a year, and these guys are amazing. Their weekly Wednesday meetings are held in Euless, Texas, and they have not missed a Wednesday since they began in 1977. I'm talking sun, rain, snow, sleet, hail, holiday, doesn't matter. They are there. And if you want to take your writing to the next level, you should be there too. Get in touch with the DFW Writers Workshop at their website, dfwwritersworkshop.org, O-R-G. Once your writing has reached publication, it's a good idea to have an organization behind you. And what better organization than the Texas Association of Authors? Texas Authors, as it is often abbreviated, it's the only organization in Texas whose focus is to promote authors within the great state of Texas itself. The association leverages the knowledge and expertise of many of its different authors to help promote others within the world of reading and writing. As a nonprofit organization, Texas Authors relies on strong relationships with individuals, 
other nonprofit organizations, and publishing companies to help establish a presence in both local and statewide events. Utilizing technology, social media, and the knowledge of its members, Texas Authors gives you a unique advantage within an already competitive marketplace. Learn more about the Texas Association of Authors on their website at books.txauthors.com. I'm sitting here with author extraordinaire Ann Fields. How are you doing? I'm doing great, AJ. Thanks for having me on the show. Well, thanks for joining me today. I know that you're a very active author and you've got quite a lot going on. I do. I do indeed. Uh, as one of the founders of the Writer's Block, that keeps me busy of itself. And then I've got my own writing that keeps me going. So the second volume of your book entitled Voices from the Block, A Legacy of African-American Literature will be coming out soon, correct? Absolutely. June 2016. What is Voices from the Block? Voices from the Block is one of the outputs of our writer's organization called the Writer's Block. The Writer's Block is a national organization of African-American writers. Uh, we have members scattered across the country, and we primarily exist to support the growth and development of African-American writers and also to promote African-American literature and literary events. We've been in existence for about um, 20 years. We started in August of 1996, and uh, we are um, a nonprofit, and we are proud to claim many published authors after they have been members, or as members, rather, and have gone through the grueling process of writing and critiquing and one of the outputs, again, is to publish and to expose them to the world of publishing. The literary world, in particular book publishing and writing, is composed of three main parts, which is the actual writing of the book. But then if you decide to publish it, that's another part. And then if you decide to make it available to readers, that's yet a third part. We wanted to expose our members to all three segments of that. And one way to do that was to actually start the Writer's Block Publishing Company, which produces Voices from the Block every other year. So it sounds like the collection touches essentially various aspects of the African-American experience. Does each story or poem within the collection follow a specific theme, or do authors have free range to contribute whatever they want? That's correct. We have an experience that is, I don't want to say it's different, but it is a different flavor to it okay. than a Caucasian experience or an Asian experience or a Hispanic experience. And it's very important that we capture that for all of eternity. <laughs> oh, man. I got to jump on that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Being a black writer myself. Right. So, speaking of, how could writers and authors who listen to this show, how could they submit their work to be included in the next volume? Well, unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on how you look at it, which side of the corn you're sitting on, um, it is open only to members of the writer's block. And again, we pour a lot of time and effort and finances into this particular project. The Voices Project is what we call it. And um, that's not to say there aren't African-American writers out in the universe that have some great legacy pieces to sure. include. Sure. But what we want to do is focus on the members who are enthusiastic about learning about the behind the scenes aspects of publishing. Um, each member has to take a certain part of the publishing process and be responsible for it. So one member may take on working with a graphic designer to design the cover. Another member may work on copywriting issues and getting our ISBN and barcodes. Another member may take on the task of working with the professional editors to make sure that the copy is as clean and tight as possible. So this is an opportunity for our members. And so right now it's only open to members, but you're certainly welcome to visit our website, www.writersblockinc.com. Dot org. Don't forget the ink and check out our membership offerings and benefits of membership. Again, we are national, so we would love to have you check us out and see if it's a good fit. OK, well, that makes sense for it to be membership only, because not only are you publishing this book, but you're also teaching authors about publishing in general and writing in general. So this is like a workshop as well. 
So there really is a lot. Right. And we set it up like that because, you know, luckily our initial president, Jacqueline Duffy, who came up with this idea, she had the foresight, thank goodness, to say, we're only going to do this every other year. And that's because we start, we, we set up a timeline at the beginning that t- takes about a year to go through the whole publishing process. And that includes the writing. Every member who submits has to go through our critique process to make sure that the piece is worthy of being published. <laughs> the dread critique. <laughs> yes, the, <laughs> the dread nightmare critique. of authors. <laughs> yes, tissues required. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the whole starting point, and that alone takes months. And then, um, you know, there's the whole back end part of publishing, and then there's the whole marketing piece once you have a book of getting it into um, Amazon and Barnes and Noble and other bookstores and having book signings and launch parties. And so we use that other, the next year to continue to promote and um, sell the book and start developing the timeline for the next volume of the book. Okay. Okay. I think that's something that a lot of folks don't realize is that uh, being an author is a multifaceted role. I mean, mm-hmm. writing the book is just a small percentage of it because you still have to promote the book. You have to figure out your marketing, your audience, and so on. It's really good that you all do that and you all teach that as well. So what do you want readers to take away from your book? And I ask this question a lot because each writer has their own unique goals for their works. I think what we envision the writer's block, you know, once you've read a poem by one of our members or read a short story by one of our members, I think we want readers to say, my God, that was great. That's good reading. I want to go and find out what else this person has written or what else is available through the writer's block. Volume one, we had stories that dealt with a couple trying to have a child and unable to and the damage that that did to their marriage. We had a poem about mental illness called Schizophrenia, which is a fabulous poem. Um, so we ran the gamut of topics in volume one, but it'll be the same in volume two, where the topics are expansive, but they all deal with a legacy of some type. That's why we spend so much time in the whole critique process. Can you summarize maybe one or two of your favorite stories within the collection or something that just grabs you as you were working on this? Oh, my gosh. Um the fictional start that's in volume two will just knock your socks off. It's written by a a lady named Stan Strong. She's writing under a pen name. And it's a murder mystery, which happens to be one of my favorite genres to read. And it is so wildly descriptive. It there's a lot of conflict on the initial pages. Uh, some great descriptions. She's got some really strong characters that will stay with readers for a long time. Um, there's another piece in volume two. Dawn Adams is one of our members, and she is one of our bashful poets. She just started doing spoken word uh, in the last couple of years, and I was just blown away by some of her poems. She has one called Motherland that's based on Africa that is just amazing. Um, we have another poet, Danette Cross, who is another one who was a little bashful with sharing her poetry at first. Um, she has one about writer's block. We tossed that idea around because one of the difficulties we have with the name writer's block is that people immediately go to the negative. And um, we always try to point out that for us, writer's block is just a collection or a neighborhood a group of writers. And so we focus on the positive aspect of the writer's block. Her poem focuses on the negative being blocked with your words. The poem was so strong, we left it in. And it's it's just a great poem for any creative, whether you're a writer or artist, or you can, you'll be able to connect with that poem and just realize, you know, this is a condition we all deal with from time to time, but get over it. It's okay. (laughs) So who are, who's the audience you're trying to target with this book? Readers. Readers who enjoy great poetry, readers who enjoy short stories, uh, readers who enjoy reading about different cultures and life experiences. So it sounds like even though the stories are written by African Americans, they're stories that we can all relate to. So the book appeals to all backgrounds and cultures. Correct. Okay. That is correct. So there's poetry in a book, there's short stories, and you, of course, have experience writing novels. 
<laughs> what do you think is more difficult to write? Short stories versus novels. Which is more difficult? That's a good question. And I'm still pondering that. And I'm going to go with short stories. Okay. And I, I keep going back and forth. But And the reason why I say I, I'm today I'm settled on short stories. Now, ask me that question next year and it might be novels. But <laughs> um, short stories, you have just a limited amount of space to tell a story. Every word has to earn its place in that story. You've got to get in conflict. You've got to get in character development. You have to get your resolute. You have to do all that within, in my case, I usually write to about 10,000 words. With novels, you have more leniency. That makes sense. And yeah, I even go back and forth with it myself because I've written novels. And right now I'm working on a romantic comedy, which is a collection of short stories, but related short stories. And it's driving me crazy. Yeah, (laughs) I understand. (laughs) So how did you first get into writing? What drew you into literature? I don't think I could have avoided it. I I was raised in a house full of readers. My mother was a reader. My dad was a reader. My grandmothers were readers. Um, The TV was on as background noise. Nobody was watching that thing. My brother was in the floor reading a comic book. My sister was on the couch reading some high thought philosophy book. She's this brainiac of the family. Um, using words I couldn't even pronounce, but, um, and then I'm over in the corner reading romance novels. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I think a natural output for me was because I had such a strong fiction reading background. When I decided I did not want to work in corporate anymore, that that was not going to be the life for me, I started looking around at what other talents and abilities I could leverage into a career. And writing just kept strongly pounding in my blood. And so I took a writing class and failed miserably at my first writing contest. It Mm. was, oh my gosh, I cried for I don't know how many days after I got all this great feedback back from the judges. But, you know, um, once I got over myself, (laughs) (laughs) I said, you know, I just need to take more classes. And so I did. And it turned out to be just a blessing to have that negative feedback in the beginning. Because one, it was true. And then two, it it just spurred me to keep going on. So I think for me, it was a natural um, next step, moving from reading to writing I have tried my hands at different forms of writing. I moved away from my corporate job in management and moved into corporate communications. And so I tried being a staff writer. I tried um, being a publicist. I was a um, editor for a newspaper for a while. Um, and I did some media type work for a ministry for a while. And none of that still was fulfilling like the fiction writing. So I said bye-bye to all that and just decided to stay at home and just write. And it was the best decision I've ever made. Yeah. I love it. <laughs> yeah. That is a reoccurring theme that writing is a process is something that you learn. Because in grade school, you learn the basics, the foundation. But, you know, just with anything that's taken to the next level, you have to learn the tools of that trade. And it's interesting because we all have these grandiose ideas of publishing our work and being bestsellers immediately overnight. Right. <laughs> and you no, know, it's a long, grueling process it is. of wash, rinse, repeat. <laughs> okay. And where can readers find you online? Online, you can find the Writer's Block at www.writersblockinc.org. And then my personal um, website for my own personal writings it's www.annfields, F-I-E-L-D-S, dot com. So stop on by. Well, thank you for joining me today, Anne. It was great talking to you and look forward to having you on again when the next volume comes out. Well, thank you, AJ. Appreciate the time. And with that, we're going to wrap up another episode. Thanks once again to Anne Fields and the members of the Writer's Block couple of line items to discuss words on the street has been going very well there are a lot of readers out there with some very interesting takes on the uh the books that they're reading so i'm hoping to have a few of those episodes done within the next couple of weeks and we'll start posting those to the podcast also check out chapter one podcast on facebook on twitter on instagram we've got the whole social media thing on lock or we will once we get some followers. 
If you're enjoying this podcast or not, or if you have suggestions of authors that you think would be a good fit, let me know. You can reach me at info at chapter one podcast.com. That's info at ch1 podcast.com. Also, I know the show has a lot of listeners who are writers, but there are also a lot of folks who are interested in writing and may not know where to begin or they're looking to take their work to the next level. I can help with that. I'll be introducing a writer's workshop both in the city of Dallas and online. The workshop's going to cover writing tips, how to develop dynamic plots and characters, the type of editing your manuscript will need, and tools and distribution platforms to get your work out there to the masses. I'm very excited about this new workshop, and in the upcoming weeks, I'll have some more information for you. So look out for that. Until next time.